I'm here to talk about fatigue management and I am hoping that I don't need to do too much persuasion of everybody in the room. I'm hoping that I don't need to talk about what fatigue is too much, but hopefully can jump straight in a little bit um, about what we can do about it and how we acknowledge fatigue with people with primary brain tumours. So historically, I think fatigue has been, it's been there. People, people have known about fatigue for many, many years, um, many hundreds of years, but because of its, it's so subjective, it's been difficult to acknowledge, to treat, it's never really been addressed. And the history, going back into the 1800s, 1900s, is it, it lay somewhere between psychology and neurology. And then much more recently, we, we then invented a, a cancer-related fatigue as a term. So I'm hoping today to talk about high-grade tumours and low-grade brain tumours and fatigue. So not all of these people with fatigue will associate with cancer-related fatigue, but it's a good place to start. And I think that if I was doing this talk 15 years ago, I would have said an underrated, under-acknowledged problem of cancer-related fatigue. But I don't think I need to say that anymore. I think there's a lot more published um, articles, books, and research about cancer-related fatigue. And, and I think that we're progressing well with that. I have a couple of books, if anybody's interested, later on. Um, and these, the books especially and the articles have been really good at getting us up to a certain level about cancer-related fatigue. And there's been some good research. There is, however, a certain point where I think talking about primary brain tumours, we do branch off from cancer-related fatigue. But it's definitely been a good springboard, I think, in raising awareness in our cancer treatment centres um, through chemotherapy, radiotherapy, um, and tumours in themselves causing fatigue. But also, we need to, sort of in the back of our minds, we also, all of us need to think about low-grade tumours and the differences. So, why is fatigue important to talk about? Why am I here? Why is it a problem? Um, and, it, and it seems to be a problem for people when their energy levels don't meet their expectations. And I think that's why it's such a subjective thing. It's, people have different expectations of what they can do in a day. Those expectations have grown with them through childhood, adolescence, and, and into their sort of adulthood. And some people do not seem to worry so much that their energy levels are fairly low because they've never been somebody who's run around and done things really quickly. And I'm sure that people in the room will acknowledge that you can have somebody that is very fit and healthy apart from their tumour, and somebody who maybe ran 10, 20, 30 miles a day. Now, when they experience fatigue, that is devastating to them. Their fatigue might still only let them run three miles a day, but that for them is still absolutely devastating. Now, if you said to somebody else, oh yeah, but so-and-so down the corridor is still running three miles a day, they go, wow, but I've never been able to run three miles a day. So, so it's very, very subjective. But I think where we can all probably meet this line is, is where it stops people from doing things with their family, where it stops people from being able... When they feel they're missing out, you know, they can't go on that bike ride, um, they, they can't go on that country walk, they can't go down to the shops or sit in the cinema... Those things, I think everybody can, can draw a parallel with. So it's not the level of energy you need throughout the day, which is variable for different people, but when it stops you doing things with your family, with your friends, stops you socialising and impacts on your quality of life. 
And then longer term, that then leads to deconditioning because people are doing less, their, their bodies become deconditioned and therefore they have less energy and therefore they are less fit. And I think also we need to acknowledge that people are told to expect to be fatigued through that first course of treatment. So we were talking before in the, about the research about the stuck treatment and the six weeks of radiotherapy with temzolamide. And I think it's, it's very expected and it, it, it's, everybody thinks they're going to be fatigued through that six weeks of radiotherapy. So sometimes, even though fatigue is a problem for people through that course, they expect it. So they're not that worried about it because that's fairly normal for people going through that. But it's then later on when it becomes a chronic, if, if it becomes a chronic problem. And this is, is where the, the, the sort of literature for brain tumour patients differs slightly or, well, deteriorates and disappears. But there is some stuff about other cancer patients because we, we have got some evidence that in other cancer groups, when that treatment phase, that initial treatment phase comes to an end, whatever the disease group is, that people start to recover from their fatigue. And this is not always the case for brain tumour patients. So as breast patients start to get over that chemotherapy, more often than not, I'm not saying for everybody, but more often than not, their fatigue starts to improve. And that isn't the same for brain tumour patients. Now, this is probably because there's a lot of differences between the treatments that brain tumour patients go through, but also the neurology of it. Um, so we, we all think that radiotherapy to the brain will cause fatigue. Um, and some of these make it even more elusive, I think. But the fact that some of our patients have got a, a neurological dysfunction, most of them will have a neurological dysfunction. Now, whether that be an obvious visual motor problem, whether it's a sensory problem, or whether it's a cognitive problem, but these people will have to put more energy and effort into doing everyday things because of their neurological deficit. So their bodies are working harder. And I think it's really important to acknowledge that even thinking, thought processing, problem solving, concentrating on a conversation, if you have a cognitive problem, it takes energy. So that can wipe people out. And they, I think that's a really important thing to stress when you're talking to people, is that just because you're sitting still doesn't mean that you're not using energy. And I think sometimes we're very good at saying about the hemiplegia, taking a lot more energy, but acknowledge the fact that cognitive problems need more energy to work through as well. Then there's the long-term effects of the radiotherapy to the brain. So the effects on the pituitary gland, um, causing problems with the whole endocrine system. People might not be producing the right amount of hormones and chemicals around their body to give them energy. So that's a longer term, late effects of radiotherapy. But some of those can be corrected. Um, and then the, I think there's the frontal tumours. And sometimes I, th I think I'm seeing anecdotally more low-grade um, survivors of frontal brain tumours um, with, with problems with fatigue. And there's a blurring there, isn't there? Because anybody who works with the sort of frontal patients, whether it be from a neurological point of view and, and head injuries, but people have that initiation and mo uh, motivational problems, which aren't fatigue. They're, they're different to fatigue, but what they do is they cause, over a long period of time, they cause deconditioning, which can then lead to an underlying fatigue. So, so those people, it's like treating somebody with a head injury that really does not want to get out of bed. And to the point where some people can't walk past their bedroom door without having that kind of urge to, to, to kind of go in and have a nap. And that is a neurological 
neuropsychological issue, but I think it does blur in when we're working with low-grade um, survivors of frontal tumours. Um, and then the other thing that I'm hearing a lot from uh, survivors of uh, brain tumours is about appetite. Whether I'm hearing it from themselves or from their families... I think that appetite, whether, now I, I don't know, and it's, it's one of those things that maybe we, sh we should be looking into in terms of research a bit more, whether it's actually a reduced appetite or whether people are doing less and therefore not needing as much energy and not eating as much because they don't feel that they are hungry. And I've been sort of work with people to try and flip that around and say, yeah, well, you might not be hungry, but if you think about it as fuel that might give you a bit more energy. But it's very difficult to persuade people, to, in their views, to overeat, to give them energy. So it's about trying to introduce healthy diets for those people. So is it a problem? We have collected some very preliminary data. It's just a, a very preliminary, not published anywhere, but the interesting thing about this is post-surgery people are telling us that rating it as 5 out of 10 on a severity scale and only 15 out of 27 people post-surgery said that fatigue was that much of a problem. Post-radiotherapy in that stuck phase, radiotherapy, chemotherapy, 17 of those people um, rated it as um, a 6 out of 10 concern. I think if we went 12 months down the line from those people that that would probably be more of a problem, but we've not got there yet. So, what can we do about it? This is, I suppose, what we all want to know is what we do about it. Listen for it. Don't ignore it. And I know that there's people in the room who are probably better than me at treating people with fatigue, so occupational therapists out there. Um, but this is kind of a, a simple kind of pathway, I suppose, that we're trying to create. I tried to do a proper pathway, but it was too complicated. So screen for treatable causes and possibly ask the person to rate their problem. Treatable causes, hopefully it makes sense to everybody that obviously if, the, if there's something there that can be medically treated, you go, yay, that'll help. Um, other things that are slightly more difficult to treat, um, anxiety, depression, stress, weight loss, pain, um, and sleep disturbance. And I think that, I mean, there's, again, there's a lot more literature around about sleep disturbance and there's a lot of different methods for helping people manage their sleep a bit better. But again, I think that's a very, very big problem for people either going through treatment and that acute phase of possibly a high-grade tumour or going through life with a low-grade tumour. There's a lot of um, anecdotally reported sleep problems. So the basic advice that you can give, everybody can give, I like, I still like the three Ps. So old-fashioned OTs in the audience out there will uh, be very familiar with the three Ps. So pacing, getting people to slow down, to pace themselves and not approach everything full pelt. Plan, so plan the week, plan the month, plan the day. Plan your larger things that you can't avoid. Block them into a diary. Block them into a time of day, so hospital appointments that can't be moved. Block them in. And then plan your other stuff, your must-dos and your wanna-dos. And you, you kind of, OK, it'd be nice if I got round to that. And, and, and make sure those things are planned in and spread them out. Now, you can go a little bit, a little bit more complicated on that. And you can try and get people to acknowledge themselves when they have more energy. So if people have more energy in the morning, then just talk to them about maybe planning the things that they really want to do that need more energy in the morning. Um, factor in that they might want to sleep as well. I sometimes talk to people about a fuel tank or a glass of water and, and try and get them to imagine that being their energy level for the day and that, that once that glass is empty, that is it. 
you know, because what we do know about this, this kind of fatigue is it's not really alleviated by rest or sleep. You can kind of top your fuel tank up a bit, but it's, it's, people aren't getting up feeling dramatically more energetic than when they go to bed. So more complex advice. It's really about signposting people, knowing your teams, knowing your areas in which you work, um, knowing who's, who's out and about and who has the skills. So that really depends on where you work, whether you're a lone worker in a hospice, whether you're in a community team, whether you're working in a hospital uh, as part of an NDT. Um, but knowing where you can get the different types of um, input for your patients from. So education, um, there's some good basic information leaflets out there. Macmillan, do, do a good one that, that, you, that it's quite easy to just hand over. I, I um, quite like uh, this one, and unfortunately, I've not put the reference down, but if anybody wants to, um, this is um, Brain Tumours and Fatigue. It's a Canadian um, publish. It, it's actually written for patients. And it's quite in depth. And it's by Nancy Conn, so C O N N, Levin, L E V I N. And if you search that, Google it, it'll come up and you can just print it off. And it's written for patients, so that's good. Um, there's a lot of, as I say, there's a lot of stuff out there about sleep and relaxation. And I think it's, it's one thing that, that none of us particularly um, adopt. I think OTs, possibly look into sort of sleep, hygiene, um, a bit more than other professions, but nobody's really kind of taken on board sleep. Um, some, there's some CBT uh, therapists out there that will work on a slightly different approach. There's one very interesting approach that one of my nurse friends uses, not within cancer and not within brain tumours, but it's very um, strict, and I don't know if anybody's heard of it. It's quite a recent one where you, you get people to acknowledge how long they're sleeping for, and you work out a percentage. So of time they're in bed and time they sleep for, you put their sleep time as a percentage, and then they have to narrow their bedtime to their sleep time. So if you only sort of acknowledge that you sleep for three hours a night... This technique will say, well, only go to bed for three hours, and when you wake up, get up. Now, I, I, I was mortified by that, and I was like, oh, no, because I'm coming at it from a cancer-related point of view, and, and people going through chemotherapy, and I'm like, oh, my God, you can't do that. But I think, having spoken to her about it, and I thought, well, actually, it might have a place for survivors of um, lower grade brain tumours who are struggling with sleep. So it's one to look out for. So I have, as well, in the last few minutes, um, just to talk through, there is, yay, linking to, to the last amazing uh, talk about research, there has been a, a recent literature review. You'll all be glad to know. Now, who's found it? Who's seen it? It's only, I think, published in March or April. Um, so Cochrane did a review of the literature. And I was like, yes, this is really exciting. And from however many articles and, and research reviews that they found, they narrowed it down to one. <laughs> they found one good quality study were primary brain tumours and fatigue. And actually, it was, was it Norwegian? Um, I'm trying to uh, find out. But anyway, it was modafinil. Modafinil? Yep. And um, they did a control group. And what they did was actually switched. So they did the control group, uh, sorry, a placebo group and the drug group. Then they had a washout period. And then they switched the group. So the, the placebo group became the drug group. And the drug group became the placebo group, which makes it a really, really good study. There wasn't much difference. They actually found that there was not a lot of difference between the placebo and the drug. But all groups reported an improvement in most of the areas. 
that they rated. So they rated like cognitive fatigue and physical fatigue, and they rated a lot of different areas. So from that, you could, you could draw a conclusion that actually acknowledging it and talking about it helped because that, there, there wasn't a noticeable improvement with the drug. Um, but we don't, we don't know whether that is the case or not. So in conclusion, I think it's something, fatigue is something that we need to acknowledge, we need to talk about. We need to know how to signpost people depending on what their issues are. We need to tell them to expect it but not impose our beliefs that it will definitely happen to them. Because if you, if you talk to somebody and say, you are going to be so tired, you're not going to be able to get out of bed, and then they go through radiotherapy, and they're, well, I'm still cycling to my treatment, I'm okay. Um, so I think we need to pitch it right, but acknowledge it when patients listen, when, when they talk to you about it and tell you, <coughs> listen, and find out what problems it's causing them. Rule out the treatable causes, you know, signpost to a dietitian or to a psychologist or talk, talk about um, antidepressants, talk about stress management, talk about sleep hygiene or signpost to somebody who can. And as I say, I was going to try and do a pathway starting with that bit, you know, treatable causes and non-treatable causes. And it was just too difficult. So I hope that that's given you a whirlwind kind of talk, but a bit of a practical idea about how to treat. So hopefully we do have time for some questions, if anybody wants to ask any questions. Oh, well, I'll ask a question then. Can I, can I ask of, of the audience, because I've, I've not looked through the delegate list yet, but who, who's working with, always with, with primary brain tumour patients? And, and who works with general cancer patients? And anybody work in neurology? Anybody come from like a, a neurology background and a neuro rehab? Yeah, brilliant. That's a nice, a nice span sky. I, I, I like to, to, to merge the, the disciplines, really, with fatigue um, and include some of the stuff, which I haven't been able to mention today, but about um, chronic fatigue and MS. Because some of, those, some of the research that we've got from MS for, for long-term survivors of brain tumour, I wonder whether the MS style of fatigue management is more relevant than the cancer-related fatigue. Um, again, I have no evidence. I, I just have it in my head, and, and I meet the person, and I, I kind of pick which approach I'm going to use depending on what their issues are and what their background is and what their disease background is. Thank you very much. <laughs>